So um, let's proceed with the <coughs> last talk of today. It's Kapir Luna on Python as a framework for analytics and protect. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I will try to be quite brief because I know we are all tired and this is the last talk of the day. But yeah, I want to talk briefly about how I'm using Python as a framework for doing analytics and growth hacking, which is a bit of a too long text. It could be the title of this talk could be as the same as yes, uh, Python as glue because it's basically what I'm going to try to tell you. But uh, more than than showing some lines of code and, and examples and running some stuff, which I will also do at the, at the end of the talk, I'm more interested in to sharing with you like a mindset in general of how to do uh, analytics uh, for, for startups, especially in a business context, but could also be applied for l larger companies, but I'm especially into the uh, startup worlds and how uh, analytics and data science uh, can, can uh, help a company growth and, and how Python can be a, a good environment to do that. Um, so first of all, I am Ignacio Lola, a bit of about myself. I have a, I'm not a software engineer. My background is in physics, so I have more of an stats and math background than a developer background. Uh, I write code. That's like, I was going to say 100% of my day, but it's Obviously not true, 75% of my day probably is writing code, 25 talking about the code that I'm going to write or scoping it, which I guess is natural. Um, but yeah, I've been, after studying physics, I've been doing some research on, on, in, on the field of systems biology, and then I've been working lately as a data scientist in a startup called uh, Import.io. Apart from all that, I am right now the man is standing between you and German beer that we will have after <laughs> this. So I know it's a quite dangerous position to be in, so I will try to be quick and to make this a, an enjoyable experience. Uh, Import.io is the startup where I'm working at the moment. Uh, what we do, it is a, just for context, um, it is a platform and a tool to do basically web scraping for people who actually don't know what web scraping is basically. So people who don't have coding skills can use our tool to extract data from the web and create APIs even if they don't know they are creating APIs. If you actually have some coding skills and you know what an API is, it's even better because every time that you train where the data is on a website, we create an API and then you can just use a REST interface to interact with that, crawl entire sites or, or whatever. And if anybody's interested in talking more about Importeo after the talk, I will be around. Uh, that's basically how our browser uh, looks like. Let's go now with the talk. What is growth? And it's not a tricky question. I, it's not like kind of a trick joke question here. Uh, it's really a question that we need to ask ourselves when we are going to try to do either growth hacking or analytics uh, in any kind of context. And it doesn't have a unique answer. I'm not going to answer that now because it depends a lot on the context and, and the industry probably. But we will see some examples uh, later on about different kind of uh, how we can measure it. Because uh, one of the most important things before we can start, uh, we can only assess what we can measure. And that's something very, very, very important. Uh, so we need to define probably what growth means to us in order to measure it, in order to identify what are the KPIs for that and how we can hack them, how we can, uh, you know, trick it into, into improving uh, and understand how it works. And why I'm talking about growth and not just analytics, uh, this is still a bit the introduction. Uh, well, because things need to have a purpose. Analytics by itself can mean you know, I take this data and do some fancy plots and here you have, and I can tell you a very nice story about it, but it might not lead into anything. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about growth because I want this analytics, I want uh, measurements to lead into, into something that we can measure, to lead into, in, in this case, into growth or something else. If you are doing analytics or you are doing data science, and uh, your analysis don't lead into real actions, either for you or for somebody else in the company, 
you're doing something wrong. That's, uh, uh, that's my opinion or, or how I see things. And so that's what I'm talking about growth. This needs to lead into uh, your business, your company, or the aspect that you try to measure growing or improving. And why Python? I'm not going to answer that now. I will answer it at the end. Uh, we will see then the, the pros and cons of using Python for this kind of stuff. First of all, uh, I always like to show this kind of stuff, and I show it in a lot of different contexts, and it always works. That's what I love, that stuff, <laughs> uh, because you can use it for anything. The hero's journey. Uh, I use it to describe what is the journey to, to do data science or to do analytics a lot of times, but I could use it probably to set, in most cases, for what software development is, or especially software development on an agile or an lean uh, environment. Uh, that's just the hero's journey on a, let's say, novel film video game context, but it works pretty well. Uh, I'm here correlating what they call call to adventure with the problem to solve or the business question because that needs to be the starting point to any kind of analysis. Uh, we always have then the data collection and data cleaning uh, process. We have uh, some exploratory data analysis, what we actually have here, what we think we can do with it, which after came what it's called in the hero's journey, the revelation, right? The, the, it's usually when, when the hero like died, but then it revert. Uh, that's when we can use algorithms and machine learning. There's, there, we could have a, dis a discussion actually if we could put algorithms and machine learning before. But I don't think it's that way because you can only start uh, to apply some machine learning to something if you actually have a very clear idea what you're going to do. Machine learning will not tell you what to do usually. Uh, will give you very concrete answers to very concrete questions. Uh, and then you just build your MVP from there or you have your answers from your business problems and then you're back into the loop because you probably need to gather some feedback, review what you have learned, and probably start all over again, or, or just you know, improving what you have started. That's why it is a cycle. Mm. So this is what I start talking about. For anything here, we need data, and we need to transform that into actions. We need to transform that into something that will change something, basically. Uh, and that data could mean anything. That data could mean the data that you have uh, in your platform. It could be log files. It could be just you know the data in Google Analytics about what people is doing in your website or, or your application, or, or data that you gather from the internet or from some open source data set about whatever. Um, we need to get data and we need to use data. That's the basic thing. Uh, getting data, I'm putting some examples things of, of places where we can get data uh, normally, so then I can build some examples on top of, of, this, of, the, of this stuff. Uh, uh, commonly Google Analytics, whoa, the colors are terrible, that was true, but you can, you can probably uh, imagine what is there. Uh, Google Analytics, everybody uses Google Analytics to one degree or other. Uh, uh, might be just your marketing team seeing what, you know, how many visitors do you have, but you can do way more complex stuff in Google Analytics. Um, Mixpanel will be like a, and, and sorry to say this, Mixpanel could be like a complex version of Google Analytics where you can like, just track more stuff to a, with a more granularity, with, with a different degree. Uh, user voice or, or Sendes, which are applications that uh, people use to do customer support or user support. Very, you, you can have an amazing source of information uh, just there. Um, and both of them have APIs where you can just grab everything and then use it for other things. Salesforce, the same. I will talk later more about Salesforce because uh, I don't know if you guys, any of you know what Salesforce is at all. It's what usually, uh, yeah, it's like a CRM that sales guys use to sell things, okay? So that's what it's called Salesforce, huge company, but uh, it has an amazing technology and you can use it for many more things than just to do sales. Uh, just sales is interesting enough because if we are talking about uh, measuring growth and hacking growth, you can use that API and see, hey, how, how many leads I have every month, how many 
uh, I don't know, uh, what is my monthly revenue, and I don't know, a lot of patterns, and you can even try to, to get smarter there and, and improve things. But apart from that, it's a, very, it's a crazy platform where you can build other things on top of it. And then I use just like a cloud database uh, icon to, to represent what could be two things, either your internal database or platform of your app or of your application or of your company, like really what things are happening. There are sometimes you're recording stuff yourself on a database or, or on, on some servers. Or also the internet by itself, which is an, a very good source of information for, for some use cases. Using data, we can have very similar services or, or uh, third parties libraries that we want to use. Uh, Excel being an, an amazing one, uh, and, and it's an, Excel is an amazing one because in Excel you can basically do anything that you want. Excel can be used as a front end for for uh, for your database, for your aggregators of analytics, KPIs, and everything. Why? Because people understand Excel. Everybody can use Excel. Uh, the CEO of your company can use Excel. Uh, your your business manager can use Excel. Your marketing guy also. You know, you cannot give them. Sometimes, well, to some of these guys, you might give them, you know, this, this Tableau connection to this crazy stuff or, or even something more complex. And they, some of them might be fine, but not all of them. But all of them will be fine with Excel. So uh, we need always to, to, to have CSVs in mind. Gecko boards, building boards of, of metrics, that's amazing. Uh, things like MailChimp, it's, it's an amazing hacking tool because you can just create, uh, I, I've been more, in contact with Mandrel than MailChimp, but I think you are basically can do in MailChimp right now everything that you used to be able to do in Mandrel. You can just, uh, you know, do your own behavioral marketing emails, campaigns, uh, on the go, on the fly. And that has an API, so you can do all that in Python, and, and it's pretty cool. And I put Salesforce in getting data and using data, and I don't want to, to spoil anything, I will talk about it later. And of course, I put like a chat, a chart um, icon to represent what is your custom reporting charts or also modeling, modeling and predictions, which uh, can be custom things that can just lead into that, into like a chart or a custom report, or even better, being integrated in some of these tools that I'm putting here. And I'm putting just some stuff as, as examples that I think are, are a bit different one from each other, so can represent something, but obviously it's not a, a comprehensive uh, list. So data to action. Data to action to me looks something like this. Uh, uh, why, why Python is great is because uh, you can interact with all these things be, through APIs and then use all the data, aggregate it, uh, even build models or do uh, some kind of analysis and prediction on it, and then use all those other tools to use that data and do something meaningful with it. Uh, I put like hard drive sign <laughs> symbol on top of Python because in a lot of implementation, a lot of people I've seen this and I've done this in the past, you can have a data warehouse in the middle of this process where you are actually storing aggregations of data or metrics and depending on the case that might be a very good idea or not. Uh, we can chat about it later. And I put a third arrow, very bad draw, but connecting uh, the first bit of the data extraction or the data gathering and the data usage because uh, we need to keep a, a, an open mind about this and not be obsessed about the tools that we use, that because we love Python or because we love this kind of pipeline and we have built this, now we are going to pass everything through that thing because uh, some things is not necessary. Uh, good example is, for example, Gecko board. In Gecko board, you can, in, you can, if you want to put, uh, to do a dashboard with metrics that came from your platform, you need to, to use the REST API, and Python is a great way to do that. You schedule a job, and then you have an amazing dashboard there. But if you're going to put just metrics that came from places like Google Analytics or Salesforce, they have their integrations. They have done it for you, and it will work better than you than what you will do. So you just need to uh, press a couple of buttons, put, put an API token, and, and it will work for you. So keep always an open mind of what the tools available are for those jobs, because sometimes uh, there, are, there are easy ways to do stuff. Um, 
One example that I told briefly uh, is about, for example, a KPI sheet, a, a K performance indicator uh, spreadsheet that that we might want to use to be reporting on 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 this growth uh, growth measures and growth measurements. Um, uh, one case, normally you have data coming from different uh, sources. You can you have data coming from Google Analytics. Salesforce, for example, about your, your sales or something like that, and your platform, what people is doing in your platform, how many signups do you have, or how many uh, usage is having and how. And uh, Python is great because you can then just use in APIs and maybe queries to your own database, uh, gather all together and, and have uh, unique scripts or unique set of scripts and modules, uh, which is what I, what I build to write that and then use that into different places. And if you have something unique to always gather this data, then you can say, okay, now I, dec I decide that I'm going to, I don't know, gather a lot of data to do a model, or I'm just gathering the data uh, and doing a summary of the last month, and I'm putting that as a row in, the sp in a spreadsheet. And the code that I put just there is just, just doing exactly that. You just gather some data, uh, not in the code, <laughs> apart, and, in, and with that, those three lines, you just for example, write a new line on a spreadsheet. Um, another example uh, is, is Salesforce. I, that's, this is what I wanted to talk about. Uh, Salesforce is uh, Salesforce has basically uh, some kind of rela relational database uh, underneath, which is actually not a relational database, but we could think about it as it is because it's very similar. Uh, they don't disclose exactly how it, the technology works, so it's hard to explain. But it's an Oracle database, uh, an Oracle database exactly. But but they don't they don't uh, they don't define exactly how are all the, the the things on it. So it's a bit hard to 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 explain it. Uh, but they, yes, they started with key value store for generic tables. They they started like that, but they have something way more complex right now with force.com and with other things on top of it. Um, the way I the way I like to use it is um, there is something that apart for for from what is called like the sales sales uh, the sales application, which is the normal things that people and the sales guys use, which have like they have ob things that they call objects, which are basically like tables. So we can think about them as tables and are like uh, leads, uh, your leads, your accounts, your uh, opportunities, your, I don't know, whatever, contacts, whatever, and, and those are related between each other, uh, and that's great. But you can build your custom tables with your custom objects and things on that. And the great thing is that if you build one of those custom apps, it's even cheaper to subscribe to that for your organization that, than to the default uh, sales thing. Uh, Salesforce has you know, its, its own programming language, more or less, to do these kind of things, which is Apex. and I have used only like very few lines, uh, but they have an API, so you can basically build everything also through an API, which is not the uh, better, the best implementation, but it's the most convenient one for some uh, things. So, for example, on Salesforce, I've built a whole, uh, a whole screenshot, let's say, of, of of aggregations of data of what is happening in Import in right now. So, I have an object called uh, users, it's basically a table of users with a lot of attributes. And for example, there I'm doing a couple of queries in Python, one to, I don't know, to gather all the users, but, and the second one is like to create a new user. And I put, and I can put a lot of custom fields that I created, like, you know, what is the date of your last uh, login? How many queries per day do you do in the platform? How many, uh, pages you have converted uh, using crawlers and, and things like that? Uh, the amazing th thing is that when you have that kind of thing, you can put many other objects on top of it, and then you can start to, to build an automate pipeline for things, you know? You can have things like, uh, I can have labels and say, these are my active users, these are my very active users, or something like that. And when, when, when a guy downgrades or upgrades, uh, I can do something. I can, I can fire from there, uh, I don't know, a message to my support people, or a message to, or a message directly to, to do some of those guys or things like that. So I can, I can do something. Um, I can take some action in base of what is happening. Um, and that's pretty interesting. Um, couple of more things that I wanted to, to show. 
and this is a bit following the, the Lean Analytics uh, methodology or, or, or track, I wanted to give one example on, on how to do a classic uh, growth hacking in acquisition and, and then some, some analysis on engagement. And hacking acquisition, I want to do something more generic. So this is something that I've seen applied to a lot of different things. I've seen that happening in Portaio shortly, more as a demo than anything. But I've seen also people doing this, especially for like uh, boost the, the usage of apps or, or any kind of, of services. Uh, what we can do is we need to, a way to do this is you need, you imagine you are, uh, you're building an app and you're la launching that app, I don't know, next week or whatever. You're very interested in gathering at least a few, I don't know, thousand users on the very beginning to get some variety. And timing there is very, very important. You need, you need to do that on a very short period of time. Um, if we are in the case of an app, for example, it's very important to gather like reviews very quick and more or less good reviews because then even if you don't have a lot of users a lot of, or a lot of installs, you can, ha you can be uh, promoted into like the, the, I don't know, the top things on the iPhone app store or something like that. And that will really give you a lot of users. Um, and people do this all the time. What you do is you may either identify potential users online or in the case of an app, reviewers. So you can go to YouTube and, and check for uh, app reviewers. You scrape the whole list in YouTube for all the people who do app reviews. And then you need to create a way uh, for them to engage with you, which might be, we don't want to spam those people because then you are, you are, you are deaf and, and that there's no point on it. You need to actually do something more meaningful. And the way I've seen people, for example, do this is I can scrape all the YouTube, oh, sorry, uh, from, from the YouTube profiles, for example, of all the app um, reviewers, uh, I gather the most important ones, the ones that I see I, they are having the, the, the biggest impact. And I get their, their Twitter profiles and I just use one of these marketing tools, which I don't remember the name, but you can just Google it. To, to send private messages to all those guys, like follow the, all those guys and send them private messages or start a conversation with all those guys and trying to engage. Most of those people do that for a living. So if you pay them some money, they will do a review for you. That that's, doesn't mean that it's going to be good or bad. It depends if your app is good or bad. But most of those people actually uh, receive money to do the, the review. Uh, but this is a great thing. If you are sure you have a good app, you pay a bit of money, you just gather the the, fir the best 100 reviewers uh, in YouTube and with a very small budget you could have, I don't know, maybe 20, 30, 40 reviews in the first 24 hours which will uh, put you on, on, on a very good position on the App Store and give you really thousands of, of users. You can then automate the process and I put the, the icon of a robot because I like it but we actually should try to be as human as possible and as less robot as possible because that is, that is when you screw the process. If you actually look like a robot and you start basically spamming people in this kind of automation process, which is, is, is possible, but I mean, everybody does it in the same way, but you can do it very good or very bad. And when Airbnb send you a behavioral email, they usually maybe do it quite well because they have a lot of different emails for different situations and they are missing it that good and maybe other people doesn't do it so good and looks like spam and you mark that as spam and, and there is no real uh, benefit from them and neither from you. Um, engagement. Let's talk for example about engagement. Engagement, uh, there, I think I wanted to talk at, at the end about these two things, acquisition and engagement, because I think there are like keys for any growth in any company. I, I found them as a key metrics for, for growth in any kind of company at a very different maybe moments, you know, maybe when you're starting, you are more looking at the acquisition, which is like the top funnel. And, and when you are more mature, you will lo be looking more about engagement. You can still put a lot of people in, in your acquisition, but if, you're, if, if your engagement is, is, is bad, your funnel is screwed and you will always end up with very few users at the end. Nobody wants that. Um, so I've built a small model to in, try to understand user, uh, usage, uh, doing a cluster analysis. Uh, I think I need to go out now from here. 
And we can try to look at it live if I find it. Mm. Let me check this is the right one. Yeah. So this is actual data of usage in import.io. I yes, I think take out all indications of what some parameters mean, so it's not too much explicit, but it's real data, basically. And we can run this together. Uh, not going to explain everything because it's super simple code. Uh, I'm just using uh, pandas and I'm using uh, skylearn to, to do some clusters. Let's load thin. Let's load this. And I'm not going to run min shift. Let's just do comments. So here we just load our model. So we, sorry, build the model with the data that we load previously in pandas. And here we can just do the clusters and, and plot them. And what we have here, the data that I have here, is just two dimensions. So it's super simple just to try to see if we can actually do something super simple with just two dimensions, with our um, volume, and volume and frequency of usage. With volume, I mean, in this case, how many, uh, making, making it simple, how many API calls you are doing to the platform, because you can be doing that really with a script, uh, doing API calls, or via an interface, but it doesn't matter. How many API calls are you doing to, to the import your platform? Uh, which is the, let me think about which, which one of the two access it is, uh, which is the one in the bottom, I think. And, and the one, or the other way around, probably. And the other one is, is, uh, is frequency, how many days you use us for, so how many days you use import.io for the total number of days that you have uh, signed up. And as you see, uh, this is completely nonsense because this, the clusters that I'm, that, that I'm uh, painting, painting here are just bands, are just bands by the frequency, so, sorry, by the volume. So if you have done much more volume, you suddenly got uh, this cluster and this other one and that one. So it's only, um, it's only obeying one of the two dimensions that I'm, that I'm plotting here. And does anybody knows why that is happening? Something quite simple, but I actually, uh, it happened all the time. Does anybody have a clue? Exactly. 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 Because the dimensions are complete are, are not normalized, so they they are completely one. It was from like from zero to one or something like that, and the other it was thousands. So then uh, the model cannot work properly because it will the weights are not are not correct. If we actually uh, change dimensions, we have something that is much more meaningful. So how did you Oh, just yeah, because I have another file where I've done it before, so I, I'm not doing it. Yes, yes, yes. I've used, I have a normalization script basically, and the clusters that we have here are basically, you know, we have a, this blue cluster over here. Yeah, you can see my cursor. It's basically people who have done very little queries and 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 have a frequency of usage very little, so have users for for. Uh, just maybe a day or a few days, and then and then stop using us. And and some of these clusters are obvious, so I'm not learning anything from them, like that one, for example. But there are others that are not so obvious, and especially uh, the ones over here, or the ones or the ones over here are not so obvious. Which is uh, people maybe who use who are doing a a lot of volume in queries, so they have a lot of usage in that sense, but maybe less frequency. Which in this case, uh, if we know a bit the platform, it's, it's people who are using crawlers. People who use crawlers, especially if are, are, and are not very technical and do that through the UI, it's people who can do one million queries one day and then not do any usage at all for the last, uh, for the next month. Uh, and that's great because this, this silly model, uh, these silly clusters are, uh, telling us already one thing that we, 
well, we could have done the clusters ourselves, but we, we can identify um, a, fit, a feature usage by just plotting and, and doing a cluster between usage and frequency. And that's great, because if we just have a couple of more dimensions, we probably can discover an, another thing. And because if we have something like this, and we tweak it enough to be good enough for, let's say, a production environment, we can use these kind of labels in, I don't know, in my Salesforce application, for example, that I told before, or even on a, on a user voice plugin, which means that when a guy is answering a support ticket, can see, hey, this guy is actually a user of these and these things, or is going to be a user of these and these features. So I can, I can give them a much better support. And that, that's a, a, a real, a, a real improvement in the experience, both, both for the, that user that is going to do, in this hypothetical case, a call to support or an email to support, and also for the support guy who is answering it, because it knows much more about it or, or what the needs could be, and can, can give much better, uh, much better support and do better job. Um, why Python? Well, especially, now we can see especially why Python is good for this, because uh, if we want to do a bit of everything, and we are not only focused on doing analysis and doing visualizations, but especially we are very interested in communicating between different APIs and, and, and gathering data from one place and putting it in another, doing something in, in between. Those kind, of ETL, those kind of ETLs where you are communicating with, with web APIs, Python is great for doing that kind of stuff. Um, now, upsize of it, it requires zero to literal data warehouse to do this kind of stuff, usually. It's very, very flexible, and, and the speed to just do one of these small hacks or to do, you know, a small widget to do something of that is almost nothing. You can do it in, in, in a few hours. Uh, the downside is also that have zero to little data warehouse. So if you actually don't plan this or don't design this correctly, then you can find that you are uh, either losing data or that you are actually generating aggregated data you need to store, and then you end up with a third leg over there of a data warehouse system that you don't know very well what to do with it. And then dependency of APIs. It's actually very nice to use APIs to do all of this work and to rely on them, but then you can have always, uh, um, if one of the things stop working, then you are actually a bit uh, screwed. It happened, as an anecdote, it happened to me just this week that um, Google deprecate uh, some of the some of their APIs in the G data li library, which they actually de deprecated like three years ago, but I didn't know about it because they were still working. So suddenly they really cut the cable without alerting anybody, and me and a lot of other people were like, "Oh, my whole thing doesn't work now, and I need to write it from scratch again." But uh, I don't think it's a very big downside because usually it's not such a, a, a big effort. And that's everything. Uh, thanks for the attention, and, and I'm open to any questions, both now and, and later over there. <laughs> any questions? Here, so. I know, I know, but, <laughs> but maybe somebody has a, like a really deep question that cannot be answered later with beer and need to, you know, need to make it now. You can. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. Guys, uh, that's um, the end of the conference. Um, thanks for joining. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having made this a great conference, great experience. Um, you can join us for a beer downstairs. The cafe is still open. Um, otherwise, have a safe trip home. And I hope to see you at the meetups for um, next year. Cool. Thank you.